first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at, that, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, well, through the summer we've been doing the series on Lunch with Jesus, and we're nearing the end of that. There's two more to go. And today we're going to look at the final meal that Jesus had with his friends, final meal before his crucifixion and death. Uh, we'll, uh, this, is a, this is the final, second to last meal he shared on earth with them, as far as we know. Uh, but I'm going to invite you to follow along as we read what may be a familiar passage to you from Matthew 26. Beginning with verse 14. And now one of the twelve, the one who's called Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priests and he asked him, What are you willing to give me if I del deliver Jesus over to you? So they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, Well, go to the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near, and I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And when evening came... Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now they were very sad, and they began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, Well, the one who dips his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. And the Son of Man will go just as it was written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Uh, then Judas, the one who would betray Jesus, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. But Jesus answered, Well, you've said so. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, it's a, a passage that is packed with a lot of stuff. And this little episode gives birth to one of the sacraments that we observe regularly. Uh, in every Christian tradition, whether it's weekly or a couple times a month or once a month or once a year, whatever it is. But uh, I want to make just three very simple observations about this passage. And one is this. Jesus, is the very last moment he has, he knows his time with these disciples is limited. He spent three years with them. He doesn't give them a, que a test. He doesn't give them a binder filled with instructions. He doesn't quiz them on everything that he taught. Rather, he wants to do something very simple. He does something with them. He eats a meal. He does something. It's also this meal where he washed their feet. He gave a model of service to them. He doesn't lecture, but rather he gives them something to do. Barbara Brown Taylor, she observed this, that with all the conceptual truths in the universe at his disposal, 
Jesus didn't give his disciples something to think about when he was gone. He gave them something concrete to do. A specific way of being together in their bodies. Things that would go on teaching them what they needed to know when he was no longer with them to teach. He said, do this. Don't believe this, but do this thing in remembrance of me. And N.T. Wright, he makes a similar observation. He says he gave them an act to perform, specifically a meal to share, a meal that speaks more volumes than any theology ever could. To eat together. He gave them something to do. Eat together. And, and the early Christians, they took this seriously. They ate together. Which might seem simple to us. Well, of course you eat together. We eat together, don't we? When we celebrate occasions, birthdays, when we mark a life of the memorial service, we share a meal, family gatherings and holidays, we eat together. Well, the, dis- the disciples, early followers of Jesus, took that seriously in Acts uh, chapter 2. We read this. as a little summary of what the early Christians were doing. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. All the believers were together. They had everything in common, sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. A couple little verses, three times it mentions food. Breaking bread together, says it twice, and eating together. It was a thing that they did. The people that followed Jesus were unique in this sense. The nowhere else in the ancient world was that type of social mingling happening. All stratas of across the social spectrum. Rich and wealthy folks, Roman soldiers, poor beggars, uh, um, widows who had nowhere else to turn, crippled folks who couldn't gain access to the temple. All together, they found something in common in Jesus and they shared this meal and they ate together. They did something. You know, sometimes it's easy for followers of Jesus to forget that mostly what he taught us to do was to do stuff, not to believe stuff. You know, when he, his final words of departure before he ascended, he said, make disciples. And what? Teach them to obey all of my commands. Teach them to do what I've taught you to do. Love God and love each other, Right? We see it in the the Sermon on the Mount, the beautiful passage, that episode from Matthew 5 through 7, three chapters of rich teaching. And at the end of it, he says, blessed are you, you're wise if you do these things. You've heard them, now do them. Live into it. So that's the first thing, a very simple observation. Following Jesus is not about a political stance. It's not just about who we affiliate with, the right people. It's not getting our doctrine straight. It's about how we live, the way of life. Secondly, is this. In this commandment, he gives us an extremely ordinary thing to do, to eat, eat together, share a meal, this rhythm of eating together. You know, since COVID, we haven't had our normal coffee hour, nor have we done our monthly meal together on the first Sunday. I'm really looking forward to getting back to that this fall. An opportunity to connect. We have had opportunities, some of us in small circles at a, at a local restaurant or in our homes to connect one-on-one. I'd encourage you, I, I'm, it heartens me when I hear stories of, hey, did you know so-and-so had these folks over for dinner Friday night? Uh, that, that cheers me. Not just because I know that family was hungry and needed to be fed. No, no, it's because of the connection and the fellowship that's happening. Because eating is not just about nourishing our bodies. I mean, it is that, right? If you don't eat, well, you can try that experiment yourself. See where it gets you. Our bodies need to be cared for with good food. And let me just say a parenthetical. If you eat a lot of crap, don't bother saying blessing over it. (laughs) Eat good food, and it'll nourish your body, right? But it's more than about nourishment for our bodies it's also for nourishment for our souls right i'm sure some of you are familiar with these studies they've been around 
40 plus years about the impact that touch has on prematurely born babies or orphans. You can take an, a preemie uh, or take a, like a, an orphan kid, but you can give them all the material nourishment they need, but deprive them of human touch, of eye contact, of hearing a human voice, and guess what happens? They fail to thrive. A high percentage of them die. Not for lack of nourishing food, but for human connection. Human connection. There's a, uh, this is going back into the 80s, but a, a psychologist, Tiffany Field, down at the University of Miami Medical School. They, there used to be a practice that when premature babies were born, you kept them in a um, little, what do you call that, incubator. Uh, and the, the practice, and Patty, you can maybe confirm this for me, was to limit touch. Because when you would in touch the child, they'd get excited and maybe become epoxic, not getting enough air. But they did some experiments and found that actually, if they did touch the child with massaging motions on their back and their neck and their, and their legs and gently moving their arms around, that that had a really positive impact. In fact, let me read what she says. This is the Dr. Tiffany Fields. She said, premature infants who were massaged for 15 minutes, three times a day, they gained weight 70 or 47 percent faster than the little infants who were left alone. And that was the usual practice in the past. But it showed that massaging infants showed signs that their nervous system was maturing more rapidly. They became more active than the other babies, more responsive to things like a human face or the sound of a rattle. She said that the massaged infants didn't eat any more than the others. But their weight gain seems to be due to the effect of human contact on their metabolism. Infants who were massaged were discharged from the hospital a whole week earlier than those who weren't. And there were positive impacts on their mental and motor abilities months and months in the future. Eating together is not just about taking in food. So feeding one another's souls. We had a, a young friend um, who Laura and I were able to visit a number of years ago out, and I can't remember where that was, somewhere west, Joanna. But when she was in the East Coast, she worked in Lynn with a little thing called the Family Dinner Project. That's sponsored by the Harvard Medical School, and it has a very simple premise. How can we resource families to do the rhythm habit, develop a habit of eating dinner together. That simple thing. And now there's been research on this 20 years plus. It says that that simple habit has profound impact on all that are involved, parents and kids. Let me read to you what, what their uh, recent studies have said. It said that recent studies link regular family dinners with many behaviors that parents pray for for their kids. Lower rates of substance abuse, lower rates of teen pregnancy and depression, as well as higher grade point averages and higher self-esteem. Studies also indicate that for young children, dinner conversation is a more potent vocabulary builder than reading. And the stories that are told around the dinner table help our kids build resilience. And the icing on the cake is that regular family meals also lower rates of obesity and eating disorders in children and adolescents. For two decades, the research is clear. There are many physical, mental health, and academic benefits for families that eat dinner together. How about that? A simple thing, but with profound stuff, because eating is not just about physical nourishment, it's about our souls, right? And when we eat together, we're not just sharing food, we're celebrating common provision for all of us. We're extending hospitality and receiving hospitality from one another. We're e expressing a posture of vulnerability, being open to one another and open to God to receive the good things that are here to share. And those simple moments knit us together into the body of Christ. It takes care of our bodies, takes care of our souls. But one more simple observation here. This wasn't just any dinner that they were having. It was the Passover meal. 
And Jesus, we learn in, in the synoptic gospels, other gospels, Jesus says, when he gets there, he says, I have eagerly looked forward to celebrating the Passover with you guys. He was longing for this moment. And he added a layer of meaning to it. Now, do you remember what the Passover meal was about, what it refers to? Some of you might. The Passover refers to way back it was 1,400 years before this night of Jesus and his disciples. It was the very last night that the Hebrews spent in slavery in Egypt. The first nine plagues, the frogs, the water turning the blood, lice and boils and cattle dying and darkness, all those things didn't have any effect. So God says, well, here's one last plague that will be effective. A horrible thing. Death of the firstborn. Firstborn in house families, households, but also of livestock and cattle. That night, the angel of death was going to sweep across the land of Egypt and call to himself the firstborn in every household. But God provided a way out for the Hebrews. He said, do this. I want you to share a special meal. I want you to take a young lamb, one year old, and without blemish, and you're to butcher it and cook it, roast it. And you and your family, and if you need extended family and even neighbors, come together because you're all going to eat one per household, one per gathering, and you're going to eat every bit of that lamb in one night. You're going to have some bitter herbs, and you're going to have some unleavened bread. That's bread that doesn't have to rise. You just mix up the dough and bake it in your skittle or skillet. And I also do this. I want you to keep your robe on and your sandals laced up like you're getting ready to go somewhere. Eat this whole meal together. That's the Passover meal. But then here's a powerful kind of imagery and significance. He says, and do this. Take the the blood of that lamb and spread it on your doorposts and across the lentil. And when the angel of death comes by and sees the blood of that innocent innocent uh, unblemished lamb over your door, the angel of death will pass over that house and will not take the firstborn. That's what Passover means. The angel of death is passing over. That the price of death is not going to be paid in this household. There's the mark of an innocent lamb on the door. And that's what they're celebrating. Jesus, he takes that long tradition, 1,400 years old tradition, and he infuses it with new meaning. And he says this, the bread you guys eat, That's my body. The wine that you drink, that's my blood spilled out. Just like that innocent lamb, mine too, is poured out to provide for you protection. The angel of death passes over. Pretty powerful image. It says, do this. Know that my blood is starting a new covenant for you. A newness of life. Now these things, you know, Jesus spoke in parables and images. And this image is kind of grotesque. Actually, in John 6, when he he tells his group of thousands of people following him, they want to get, we talked about this earlier in our summer, they want free lunch again. They want want him to multiply bread and feed them again. He said, I'm not going to do it. But if you want something to eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, ah, gross, you're, you're weird. And many, most of his followers left him that day because they couldn't get what he was talking about. How do we make sense of that? Jesus saying he gives himself for us. Well, here's one little way that I think is helpful to think about the power of blood. And it comes from a little book. I'd recommend this to anybody. Uh, it's written by a physician, Paul Brand, and a writer, Phil Yancey, fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, and what I'm going to share next comes from this book. Uh, Paul Brand um, he was a osteopathic surgeon, born in India, uh, educated in England, went back to India, spent most of his life working on trying to understand and alleviate and prevent the spread of leprosy. In fact, he made such incredible contribution to that field uh, that he, you know, he was made a commander in the uh, order of the British Empire for his contributions to me. And he did so at great personal sacrifice. Uh, he didn't use his privilege and education to just cushion his own life, but he poured himself out 
for other folks, but he almost did not become a surgeon. He, he almost avoided medicine altogether. His dad was a medicine uh, a, a doctor in rural India, and as a small boy, Paul was often called to his dad's side to hold bandages and instruments when his dad was caring for patients. And one job he remembers was watching as his dad would uh, clean abscesses and debrayed wounds. Uh, and, um, and he said it was just gross. The pus and the blood and the gore and the sticky cleanup mess when it was over. He said, I'd had enough. Blood that was shed turned me off of medicine. I didn't want anything to do with it. Instead, he apprenticed as a carpenter and a bricklayer. And he was all excited to go back to India to be a builder. But uh, he got the counsel that if he's going to work in rural India, he ought to understand the very rudiments of, uh, of tropical medicine. So he enrolled in just one introductory course uh, at the hospital there in London. And he was, it was the Connaught Hospital, same course his dad had taken decades earlier. And I'm going to read now his words about an experience. He said, one evening during my stint there, my whole view of medicine and of blood was permanently shifted. That night, hospital orderlies wheeled a young accident victim into my ward. The loss of blood had given her skin an unearthly paleness. Her brownish hair seemed to jet black in contrast. Oxygen starvation had shut down her brain into a state of unconsciousness. And the hospital staff lurched into their controlled panic response to a trauma patient. A nurse rushed down the corridor for a bottle of blood while a doctor fumbled with a transfusion apparatus. And another doctor, glancing at my white coat, thrust a blood pressure cuff at me. Now, fortunately, I'd already learned how to read a pulse and take blood pressure, but I could not detect the faintest flicker of a pulse on the woman's cold, damp wrist. She didn't even seem to be breathing, and I felt for sure she was dead. In the glare of the hospital light, she looked like a wax Madonna or an alabaster saint from some cathedral. Even her lips were pallid. Only a few freckles stood out against the pallor. Well, the nurse arrived with a bottle of blood and buckled it into a metal stand as the doctor punctured the woman's vein with a large needle. They fastened the bottle high using an extra long tube so as to increase the pressure uh, of the blood flying into her body. And keep watch, the staff said, and they scurried off for more blood. Now nothing in my memory can compare to the excitement of what happened next. The details of that scene come to me even now with a start. As the others left, I nervously held the woman's wrist. And then suddenly, I felt the faintest press of a pulse. Or maybe that was just my own fingers. Well, I searched again, and there it was, barely perceptible, but there was a tremor. And with the next pint of blood, the staff quickly replaced the empty bottle, and a spot of pink appeared like a drop of watercolor on the patient's cheek. And she began to, it began to spread into a lovely flush. And her lips darkened pink and then red. And her body quivered with a kind of sighing breath. And then her eyelids fluttered lightly and parted. And she squinted at first. Her pupils contracted, reacting to the bright lights. And then at last she looked directly at me. And to my enormous surprise, she spoke. Water, she said. Brand says, this young woman was only in my life for an hour or so, but the experience left me utterly changed. The memory of shed blood back in my dad's clinic had kept me out of medicine, but the power of shared blood ultimately led me to apply to medical school. I had seen a miracle, a corpse resurrected. <laughs> what a great image, the power of blood. What a powerful image of Christ's blood. We use the word, his blood shed for you. What if we instead focus on Christ's blood shared for us? If we're willing to let ourselves, our own lives, have a transfusion of Christ's life in us. You know, blood, physicians know this. Blood is life. When Christ shares his blood, he shares his life. It's like getting a transfusion. This meal, it's not just about our bodies. It's not just about our souls. It's about our spirits, too. 
It's about being revived. I don't know about you, but it's not uncommon for me to feel like I'm hollowed out, like a corpse, like the life I have is withered away and what the future holds isn't much. But when I open myself again to the life-giving power of Jesus in me, it's like a blood transfusion. It's new life. I think that's maybe a helpful metaphor of what's going on spiritually. Jesus tells his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. You know, this is a celebration for these guys. It's a celebration among friends and friendship with Jesus. A celebration of the life that is ours that brings dead bodies back to life. Yeah. It's a great celebration. And we live into it. He also told them, as often as you do this, you remember my death until I come again. And that's a clue about how we'll wrap up this series on our final meals with Jesus. But for now, let's, let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks that in your wisdom, in your fine craftsmanship, you've somehow miraculously, out of the dust and dirt of this world, risen us up into living, breathing beings with bodies that are fearfully and wonderfully made. And more than that, you've appointed this environment in ways that meet our every need. And we thank you for the abundance of food that we share. We also thank you, Lord, that you've provided for the needs of our souls through family and friendship and given us rhythms to observe that help us connect with one another to affirm our belonging to one another in one body. We thank you too, Lord, that you've cared for our spirits, that through Christ's life and death, you've given us a pathway to new life. And we pray that we would walk fully in that by the power of your spirit. And we pray that in all ways, we would grow up into the fullness of his body, uh, that your will can be accomplished in this world and in and through us. And it's in his life, or in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, friends, I invite you, if you're able to stand, and we'll sing together our final hymn. You'll find that in the insert in the bulletin, as a fire is meant for burning. <laughs>